and welcome to the next episode in this series, where we invite you to join us as we progress along the entire creation process, from conception all the way to the production of a tabletop game. If you've just joined us, the game we are developing is a small, card-based game designed to fit into the universe of our big box dystopian sci-fi game, Solar 175, which is live now on our Late Pledge platform, GameFound. If this sounds interesting to you, you can find the link for this in the description below. Now, this small card-based game is themed around the Gonza Index, the most valuable stock market in the Solar 175 universe. This episode will take you on our journey to create an awesome user experience for our players. Terms like user experience and user interface, often abbreviated to UX, UI, are more commonly associated with the development of software applications than tabletop games. But there is actually a lot of wisdom in this field that extends beyond the digital and into our own medium. Put simply, very probably far too simply, these terms refer to any aspects of a system that a user interacts with and the experience they have as they do so. I should clarify, while some modern tabletop games have inbuilt apps and even full digital adaptations, these are not the user interfaces I'm thinking of in this video. Instead, we're interested in how the graphic design, art and components of a tabletop game changes and enhances the experience of players. Several heuristics have been developed to help us understand what makes a good user interface. One we'll look at was developed by Dr. Jacob Nielsen in his 1993 book, Usability Engineering. Nielsen argues that for a product to be usable, it must at a minimum consider these five basic dimensions. Number one, learnability. How easily can you learn to use the product? Number two, efficiency. Once they have learned how to use it, how quickly does it do what it's supposed to do? Number three, memorability. How long does it take to forget how to use it? Number four, error tolerance and prevention. How many errors do users make when using the product? And lastly, satisfaction. How enjoyable is the product to interact with? When we apply this heuristic to tabletop games, it can be an extremely useful tool to improve them. The first and possibly most important step to this is graphic design. Now, to understand graphic design, it is important to distinguish it from illustration. Whilst illustrations will cover the artwork and theme of your game, the graphic design is more behind the scenes and focused on usability. Graphic design covers the creation of your symbology, the style and size of your icons, and the layout and readability of your text. Graphic design is something that, if done well, most people don't notice but if done badly, can really mess up a game. An interesting aspect of graphic design, as opposed to artwork, is that it is actually a much more objective activity. So, which graphic design techniques can we use to help improve the usability of our games? The first of these I will discuss is the concept of visual hierarchy. This is the way that different aspects of a user interface interact with each other and compete for user attention. As Nielsen puts it, visual hierarchy controls the delivery of the experience. If you have a hard time figuring out where to look on a page, it's more than likely that its layout is missing a clear visual hierarchy. For Nielsen, this involves being intentional about how you use the following elements. Size. Users notice larger elements more easily. Color. Brighter colors typically attract more attention than muted ones. Contrast. Dramatically contrasted colours are more eye-catching. Alignment. Out-of-alignment elements stand out over aligned ones. Repetition. Repeating styles can suggest content is related. Proximity. Closely spaced elements seem related. White space. More space around elements draws the eye towards them. Texture and style. Richer textures stand out over flat ones. When designing games, we need to think about how these elements are being used to bring out the important elements of a game component. Take this card from Everdell, for example. There is a lot of information contained within this card. The top left of the card contains the requirements needed to play it, 
and these are laid out consistently on each card. So the berries will always appear here on the card, even if they are the only requirements needed. This creates a consistent language within the game, which is something that I will discuss later in more detail. The biggest text on the card is for the title, which has a specific colour background relating to its type. The type is also displayed here on the centre left with an icon to make it quicker to identify and help colourblind players also identify the type. The giant circle here indicates the points this card is worth, and the most readable text on the scroll at the bottom indicates the unique effect of the card. If there's any flavour text, it is the smallest and featured at the bottom of the card, allowing players to interact with the theme more or less depending on their preference. Similar approaches to graphic design are used widely in tabletop games, and have been developed and refined over the centuries. These Dutch cards date back to the 15th century. What you notice is different about the graphic design. Can you see it? Modern cards always show the suit and number in the top left corner, which is reserved and flipped in the bottom right. This means that whichever way round you hold a card, the top left will immediately give you all of the information you need. This is really helpful if you are holding a hand of cards, as this section is often the only visible part of each one. Whichever way round your cards are, you can read them quickly at just a glance. This is such a useful and well-known trick that it is prevalent in almost every game you see. The top left corner of the card is where the first information you'll need is located, so it's not an accident that the requirements to play this Everdell card are also here. Techniques such as these essentially create a universal shorthand language amongst people, and utilising this language is really helpful. When you open a new program on the computer, how do you know that double-clicking on an icon will open it? Why not hover over and press the Enter key, or click once but for a longer time? It's because software developers know their users will try this first based on their experience of other software. Unless they have a really important reason to break this norm, they want their users' experiences to match their expectations, and so they follow along. The helpfulness of consistency can even boil down to the level of individual games. Christian Strain, writing in the League of Game Makers in 2016, has a useful approach to this in the tabletop field. When working on the game Campaign Trail, he noticed that the airport icons in each of the US states on the main game board were in different places each time, perhaps corresponding with their actual geographical positions. Instead of this, he placed them all at the top left of the state's banner icons, arguing, The beauty of this is, it won't be something explained in the rulebook. Placement of icons, text, and art is a focus on how the mind naturally searches and finds things. A graphic designer's job includes trying to think about what is easiest and natural for the player to do, in order to find the information they need. If done correctly, the player won't even consider how easy it was to do something based on the graphic design. In tabletop games, we can use these universal norms to our advantage. We know what it means to place a worker or draw a card, because we have seen these things before. This is the problem faced by those who want to create something radically different from what has come before. People enjoy change, variety and newness, but too much of it can be really overwhelming. Tabletop games can also create their own internal languages using symbology. Effective use of this can greatly speed up gameplay, but the disadvantage of this is that it will have to be learned independently first. Symbols are a crucial tool in game design, as they are in real life. Symbols allow us to boil down relatively complex ideas into a simple icon. Symbols can quickly relate to us anything from relatively simple ideas like these to fantastically big and complex ideas like these. If you can teach players a new symbology, you can express your ideas much more efficiently than you could with words. Take this token from Hanami Koji. It means that on your turn, you can take any four cards from your hand, separate them into two equal piles of two, and pass them to your opponent face up. They'll look at them, choose one pile to play immediately into the row of geishas, onto their side of these cards, and then you do the same with the remaining piles of two cards. This is a lot of information to learn, 
But imagine if you replaced this symbol with that explanation. It simply doesn't work. That being said, it is also important to make sure not to overdo your symbology, beyond the patience of your players. If you are creating a game for a light general audience, the amount of symbols players will be willing to learn is far lower than if you are creating a game for the expert hobby market. Take the classic game Race for the Galaxy. This game packs in a large amount of in-game complexity, with only a minimum amount of components, and symbology is the key to this ability. This means that you can have some very intriguing gameplay and lots of interesting choices with only a minimal amount of components. Now the downside is that learning all these symbols is a massive, possibly insurmountable, barrier to players new to the hobby. To illustrate this, here are all of the components in the base game, and this is the player aid needed to help with gameplay. It's also double-sided. Another great tip for using symbology is to aim for your symbols to be easy to read and to relate as closely as possible to their actions. Again, there is nothing wrong with being unoriginal here. If you want to represent a player's health in a game, then think carefully before using this rather than this. It may very well be true that the race of alien creatures you play as in your game do not have hearts and instead are powered by a unique fusion of organic and bioelectrical compounds, but do you really need to add this extra little barrier to entry to your game? Maybe you do, maybe the extra immersion is worth it, but designers need to think carefully about each of these extra demands on their players. One option, if you want to add some uniqueness to an icon, whilst retaining its natural and historical comprehensibility, is to simply stylize it. This is how video game company Valve handles health in Half-Life Alex. It still hearts, but depicted in a sci-fi stylized way. It does say health in the bottom left of the screen, but it doesn't really need to. Most players will instinctively understand what this represents. Likewise, remember the visual hierarchy and be careful not to let your symbols disappear into the background. Artwork is very important to increase immersion and theme, but if it makes symbols hard to read, it can really hamper a player's in-game experience. So with all of that being said, how are we going to approach the user interface of Gonza Index? Being a small dice game with a lot of player choice and interaction, this is a challenging prospect. The first thing we did was to develop the iconography for the game. Gonza Index is set in the same universe as our latest big box game, Solar 175, and so this process was a little easier than it has been with previous games, as much of the iconography could be directly translated from Solar into this game. This will also really help players learn the game if they have already played Solar 175 and vice versa, which as the two games are being released together is a nice little bonus. For the main actions of the game, we decided to use symbols entirely. There are six main actions and each one needs a unique icon. These needed to be related closely to their action and easily distinct from each other. This was our first attempt. We then playtested these and looked to see how the players interacted with them and made changes accordingly. Take the symbols to increase and decrease stock values, for example. They initially started like this, as we felt the symbols were simple, related to each other and importantly congruent with the actions they represented. But after playtesting, however, the feedback we received was that the two symbols to increase and decrease stocks were too similar, which they are. To fix this, we added plus and minus symbols on them, and changed the colours to red for down and green for up. This generally worked, but it did not work as well with colourblind playtesters, and so we changed the colours from red and green to purple and orange. The broker cards each have unique powers on them, and need to be thematic with their unique works of art. As such, we placed the actions of each card in the same place on every card, and every card has a unique symbol and a brief explanation of its power. There are only 14 of these cards in the game, so this doesn't become overwhelming. And the more you play, the less players use the text and the more they use the iconography. Take this card for example. A lot of the card is taken up by the artwork from the amazingly talented Adam Beachy. 
And as a side note, if you want to know more about the art choices for this game, then I recommend looking at our last video. The artwork is in its own box, and below this is the card title and then a box containing the symbology and card power description. The large symbol is in high contrast to the dark red behind it. This makes it stand out clearly from the card. The symbol itself is simple. It is a plus next to the corporation symbol. This corporation symbol is on the back of all corporation cards, and it therefore indicates that you should add a new one to the game. The text below goes into more detail on this, so that in early games a rulebook reference isn't needed for the specifics. Incidentally, the corporation symbol was chosen because it has the letter C on it, which helps and is reminiscent of the copyright symbol, which we thought helped put people in the minds of the corporations. Similarly, the event cards have big dramatic artwork to demonstrate the theme, but the gameplay effects were always on the same side of the card, in the same order, similar to the card requirements in Everdell. This allows players to quickly learn where to look and enables them to speed read these card effects. Now, one problem we had was with the tracking of the value of each corporation's stock. The track down the left hand side of each card initially had the numbers inside the track. Now, this unfortunately covered the value and made it tricky to read. In addition to this, the credit trackers would often become dislodged and we would have to remember where they were on the track. Not ideal. Our solution to these issues was to move the numerical values to the right of the tracker to make it more visible. We then double layered these specific cards and put cutouts in the top layer so that this section could be indented, thus securing the tracker tokens in place. A final point is that we are adding comprehensive reference cards for each player in the game. These cards have a brief summary of each of the six actions and are very useful for giving players new to the game a quick reminder of these rules decreasing the need for mid-game rulebook references. Reference cards are a great addition to nearly all board games, but I won't go into much more detail on these as they probably weren't an entire video to themselves. Now that's enough from me, so thank you very much for watching. If you want to explore our games more or even place an order, head to the link below. And if you found this video useful, we'd really, really appreciate it if you could like and subscribe to show your support. Last but not least, a massive shout out to our patrons who help us bring you these videos on our channel. See you next time. Bye.